Matt, we're not quite good yet because we got to do one thing. What? Oh, okay. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. <laughs> Sprayed all that foam right into the mic. All right, are we are we tasting it? Oh yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's pretty good, actually. Could get used to it. It's not until it, it hits you, like it it goes down okay, and then sits, and that's really the problem. See, maybe this is a genetic thing, like the uh, Brussels sprouts thing, because. I gotta say, I don't. I'm not getting the bitterness that, that people talk about. Interesting. Uh, I mean, I the, like Brussels sprouts. I mean, I mean, root beer also has kind of a bitter aftertaste to me. Uh, so, not to me though. But I don't mind it. It's like that's the. I I just want to say that this has 37 grams of sugar in this can. <laughs> so that's why I'm only gonna have a couple sips because which is which is an absurd amount of sugar. Yeah oh my god <laughs> oh yeah okay we did it for the the bit can we stop drinking this now yeah. unfortunately now it's just gonna sit on my desk and i'm gonna be tempted by it so oh. yeah yeah i you know i said on my video that i enjoyed it um but i have not like then gone on to drink more of it like i definitely have not had any more until just this moment well i don't really drink soda but yeah i my mean kids, me, me neither my kids liked it and funnily enough, my youngest literally said, without any prompting or, or, or arranging the situation for me, she goes, Moxie is really good, but kind of bitter at the last. <laughs> Which I thought was a delightfully Shakespearean phrasing and also <laughs> exactly the what other people say about it. Yeah. No, she's got it. She should be a, a food critic. Yeah. All right, should we do the podcast let's, now? Let's do it. Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series, and beyond. I am your host, constant reader, reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined as always by my swing dancing partner, Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? We're going to do this podcast nice and slow, make sure that we hit all the twists and the bips and the bops <laughs> and the dosy dos. It's uh, not quite my tempo. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this week on the show, our series examining Stephen King's 11 63 continues with part two as we take a look at chapters five and six of the novel. Jake heads back into 1958 for the second time, but this time he's on a mission to stop the father of Harry Dunning from horribly murdering his entire family. This takes him, Matt, to the city of Derry, and we get to meet a couple of old friends Matt, what did you think of this week's reading? Um, delightful, just delightful. Um, you know, I, l luckily my trick memory um, re ejected the knowledge that Bev was in this book, which I think I might have read in some totally unrelated context. But oh, interesting. Um, so, so I totally forgot. I, I had read that, and then I totally forgot about it. So it was a fresh surprise when we got to this point. Um, but uh, yeah, it was re really, really fun, really interesting that we we go back to Derry. And um, it's like it's a fun new angle on mm -hmm. Derry and it's doing a lot of interesting things, a lot of specific things that we're going to a lot of fun talking about today, I'm sure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there is, you know, a shorter read this week than last week. Last week we had like 90 some pages. This week we only have 50 some. So we have a lot less uh, content to cover this week. But I think there's there's so there's so much going on here that there's certainly a lot to say. Absolutely. All right. Um Let's let's get into it, Matt. Let's do it. All right. Before we do that, though, we did just want to once again, and we will keep doing this every week until June the 14th. But we wanted to once again remind y'all about our Kingslingers live event, June 14th, 15th and 16th, with the actual live show happening on Saturday, June 15th up in Bangor, Maine. Um, there are still tickets left. We're, we're doing pretty good on these, Matt. I think we said last week there were there were about 40 and I'm looking at the list right now and there we're down to 29 
29 remaining tickets for the live event on Saturday, June 15th. Um, so there's still seats available, but the, I, I'm, at this point, I'm starting to think we're probably going to sell out. So if you've been just kind of waiting and and being a little noncommittal, I think now would be the time uh, to pull the trigger because, uh, you know, we weren't sure. We knew we were going to sell out the tours, which we did very, very quickly, um, but we weren't sure if we would sell out the, the tickets to the actual event itself. And with less than 30 now, um, it's seeming like that's very, very possible. So so yeah, um, head to doofmedia.com slash Kingslingers Live, which will send you over to the Ticket Spice page, which will have all the details on those tickets, how to get them. Also, our, our T-shirts, um, which which we were had some conversations about the design on the T-shirts and the posters and stuff, and it's all all the swag stuff's looking looking really cool. Um, so it's uh, we're at six. Just, I'm I'm really excited, man. I'm not even saying words anymore. I'm just really excited. <laughs> I'm really excited too. Yeah. So head on over there. Uh, like Scott said, not too much time left. So uh, pull the trigger. Yeah. I think uh, Jody sent us our, our meeting invite for our meeting uh, in a couple weeks uh, to kind of go over some of the last minute things. And I think the meeting was titled six weeks till the event. And I went, Oh shit. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not too many weeks, but I think <laughs> we're, we're recording this on the 16th of, of April. So that's, that's two months. To almost to the day yeah. uh, till our event so um it's it's coming fast yeah very excited absolutely so yeah once again head to www.doofmedia.com slash kingslingers live all one word and uh, get all the information there and and get those 29 tickets you could be the last seat sold that would be exciting i hear you'll win a prize <laughs> is, is that true no, it's not. That's not true. <laughs> can I can I get in trouble for this? Uh, yeah, we, no, no, just, uh, I made that up. It's not true. It was a rumor. <laughs> You'll win a a prize in your heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt. Let's get into it. We begin this week with chapter five. Uh, we're actually moving into part two of the novel. By the way, we we talked about this last week, but um, we have we have entered into part two of the book titled. Uh, the janitor's father. And so basically the, the book is telegraphing to us that this next section, however many pages it is, will be dealing with Jake's journey uh, to to save Harry Dunning and his family. Um, so we didn't finish. We won't finish that up this week. Right. We only I think are about halfway through it. I believe it will be next week's reading, which will technically finish up this part of the novel. Um, but we kind of go into this knowing that this is going to be the goal and the focus of everything uh, for the next at least at least 100 pages, which once again, I want to remind you, we're in a book about the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I mean, it's it's almost like a like an episodic um, book, right? It's like yeah. a book. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a book that seems to contain within within itself a natural structure that breaks down into these pieces, you know, like, OK, Part part one, you know, gentle introduction to the idea of time travel and its rules. Part two, hmm, all right, let's let's test this baby out. Like it really, it really, it almost has like a season of TV structure to it, you know. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. Um, all right, so in chapter five, Jack's, Jake, Jack, Jake steps into 1985. This time with the intent on changing the past, and the first thing that happens to him is an altercation with the yellow card man. Though, this one doesn't go exactly like the last one did. This time, the yellow card man almost knocks him over. Uh, the, the text really emphasizes rep repetition, right? Like, and, and how much of a change this is. We get a three beat very early on where we repeat the phrase, just like before, you know, just like before he walks under the thing, just like before he goes over here, just like before he does this. And then that's suddenly interrupted by him getting bumped into by the yellow card man. And, and we once again get that feeling that this guy knows something. This time he says directly to Jake, you're not supposed to be here, which could just be like an innocent, haha, you're behind the, the, the rope. You're not supposed to be back here in this, mm -hmm. this working factory. But I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Like it, it, it in, in, when you're, when you're a time traveling man, that's just walked into 1958. Like it, it's pretty obvious what we're referring to here. Right. Uh, absolutely um in fact yeah i mean something's obviously missed the other thing about the yellow card man which did occur to me previously um but i'm i guess i'm only now saying is like the, a yellow card isn't that i'm not a sports person as you as you're aware but isn't that basically like a foul in uh european football yeah matt why don't you uh briefly explain to me the penalty rules of um of, of football 
Well, if you commit a foul, mm-hmm. um, then you receive a yellow card. Yep. And what does that what does that mean when you get a yellow card? That means that you have to um do uh, uh the opponent gets free throws <laughs> at the free throw line. <laughs> Um, and then you, and then they get, they get first down. Okay. So, yeah, um, yeah. it's so, basically, it's, it's a warning. I mean, there's normally like a, a penalty kick or a, a free kick depending on where on the field it is, but, um, it, it's a warning. It's um, a warning. And a yellow light is a warning. Yellow, you know, yellow tape means warning. Yellow means warning. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the interesting thing of course is not is is first thing he sees when he gets out of the time portal is is a warning and not only does he get a warning but the the, the warning is is turning from yellow to orange perhaps <laughs> edging toward red um yeah yeah that, that you're right that that is like as evidence that this yellow card man is unique and special is not just the fact that that things with him have clearly changed but also that the card itself has physically changed, right? That, Mm -hmm. and this could not be a direct result of anything Jake has done differently in his first minute of his time on this trip. Right. So it has to be something extra textual, I guess is the phrase I'm thinking of to this specific trip, because Mm -hmm. like he didn't just like quickly yank down the yellow card and throw up an orange card. Right. Right. Or maybe he did, but, but it doesn't seem to be that way. But if so, why would he? Right. So that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my best guess, if, if I were trying to explain why this is within the mechanics of sort of the cosmology Stephen King has set up, is that Jake is actually not jumping back to the same past every time. He's jumping back to slightly different realities every time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now I say that, and then and then one immediately says, well, that doesn't quite work, because in order to change the past, you know, and then step back into the future and observe the change that you just made, it kind of has to be the same timeline. Um, but then, then I, then I say, well, <laughs> you could be stepping back into like past a, and then you step into the future of, of that timeline. You never actually return to your original timeline. And then you step into the, you step into timeline B and you step into the future of timeline B. You never go back to timeline a. And then I, this is the point at which I start, you know, uh, <laughs> flailing my arms and putting uh, yarn on the cork board and because yeah. it's like i think everything i just said makes perfect sense actually and doesn't contain any contradictions but it's like you th- this this is why there's the line in in the, the bruce willis movie where he says i don't want to talk about time travel shit because um <laughs> it just it, it it consumes your entire like perception of the thing and i yeah. i don't i honestly wasn't even thinking about this at all i was just like huh i wonder if it's like different timelines and then i kept reading get out the chalkboard doc brown it'll be yeah. it'll be fine yeah yeah um yeah i mean like the, the time travel stories are always going to contradict themselves in some ways like both back to the futures one and two have pretty distinct problems with them <laughs> that that would if you think about it for longer than a couple minutes would completely break the movie but who who cares no one yeah. cares it's magic yeah um, yeah, and, and just to, to finish this thought, I, I want to, you know, two yellow cards does Matt equal a red card? <gasps> and and a red card is when you uh, you get thrown out of the game. So time travel is soccer. <laughs> and of course, as you know, of course, Matt, you know that when a, a, pre- a player is removed from the game via a red card, um, it's not like they just get to replace him with a new player. It means your team is just a player down for the rest of the game. Okay. I, I, know, I know you knew this, right? I don't know why you would be telling me this if it didn't, you know, matter in some incredibly relevant way. Um, no, I'm just I, fucking I, with you, man. No, I'm I just, didn't. That, that's, all, that's all it is. I didn't know. I didn't know that about soccer. I had no yeah, idea. Yeah, that's, that's true. Okay. Um, just flexing my, my deep soccer knowledge on you that I gained from uh, watching the World Cup every four <laughs> years. Yeah, I remember that. And, and doing nothing else. I remember when you did that and told me about it and I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i played soccer when i was a kid but i quit before it became serious right right of course um anyway let's uh so so jake seems intent on starting things out on this trip by basically retracing his steps he heads back into the kennebec fruit company and reorders his original root beer but things 
go a little bit differently this time, Matt. Um, I, I love this quote here. For a moment, I didn't respond, but not because I was stumped for an answer. What was throwing me was the way the scene kept diverging from and then returning to the original script. And I love this idea, Matt. I love this kind of matches with something you said last week that I really liked. This idea that small changes in a timeline don't actually propagate out in a butterfly effect like way. That that the system or time in this case seems to self-correct. That this idea that this conversation goes a little bit differently because Jake is saying things a little bit differently. But um everything seems to eventually like get back on its track like fred was always going to say this particular thing on this particular visit and he might also say some other things based on some things jake says to him but essentially things play out similarly enough right i I love i love that idea of of you know kind of going off the track a little bit but then uh going back on and and the way the way events weave around that the like the fact that there is a track right there's a track at all says something yeah and none of it seems obviously supernatural at, at least not yet um mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and that's actually fun to me like it's not that it's obviously like oh the universe wants to correct the timeline and it's like cosmic forces are are colluding it's like well i mean it could just be that this guy at this store basically follows the same routines every day of his life and, and kind of responds in predictable ways and, and and says certain things in certain situations. And th- there's kind of a track to his life. And, and, you know, if you nudge him out of his track, he's going to return to his track. Um, and that could be all it is. Now mm-hmm. I admit that I think we probably are going in more of a, the supernatural, the timeline wants to restore itself type type, type direction. Um, but I, I I like this idea that that's not even required. It's just I, I think I just like it because it's refreshing. Like we've seen the butterfly mm-hmm. effect as a concept in virtually every time travel thing that we have encountered. Just yeah, and and um, like the the only <laughs> the only exception I can really think of is like Edge of Tomorrow specifically because that's a movie where um the the difficulty of of surpassing this one really difficult obstacle is is central um yeah it's not yeah. so much that like the timeline is is protecting itself it's just this one this one thing is really hard to do um mm-hmm. so that so this yeah. really is a very interesting and, and and unique idea i agree with that although i mean to to almost perhaps contradict this idea that we've been talking about the the text points out specifically that frankie gets an ice cream this time which is not Mm -hmm. something he did last time and of course we remember that the conversation with frank last time ended with um jake telling frank hey tell your teacher um it doesn't matter if you understand the story or not uh and he said he was going to do that and he doesn't this time um but he does get ice cream so when frank gets diabetes in 30 years um it's because he had ice cream this one time yeah yeah, or or doesn't become a great literary figure because he didn't yeah. have that argument with his English teacher. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it is fun to think about the way these things could propagate out like that. But the the book is playing pretty close to the the chest with some of this stuff. Yep. So Jake asks for the bathroom and a motel, uh, and Frank sends him over to Titus Chevron and then to the motor court up the road. And and I pulled this out just because I find it absolutely delightful but um as he's as uh, he's walking out um one of the the women looking at fruit calls out to frank and says are these oranges fresh as fresh as your smile leola he replied and the ladies tee heed i'm not trying to be cute here they actually tee heed <laughs> that's great um I, I noticed a lot more this week that jake's narrative voice is actually pretty unique and, and yeah. you know somewhat intrusive in a fun way mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of little affectations like that and actually there's a bit more of, of the like um acknowledging that he's telling this story um yeah so yeah but yeah. it's interesting that we're not getting like the the scaffolding on the telling of the story that we sometimes get in other king things right like, mm-hmm. like i mean duma is a great example where that was also a first person narrative and we were also getting the information relayed to us like like uh, Edgar was telling the story to us but we kind of had at least a, a rough outline of this is me four years down the road thinking back about these events and and being melancholy about them because I'm sad about it and and that's and I'm relaying the story to you that way we don't have any kind of that that structure to Jake's tale here right it's just right being told to us and yet the narrator has this voice of yeah you're, you're absolutely right you know 
directly talking to us in in this this kind of adorable way of I'm not trying to be cute here, but also, yeah, like acknowledging that he knows the future events because he's telling you the story. Yeah, I, I think I think what we said about the prologue was that um, or, or the yeah prologue was that it, it it was unclear when or where this was being told to us from. It's just yeah. this sort of a fl- floating amorphous point of view. Um, I'm, I'm starting to think that one thing that that allows us to do is, is that, well, we're not sure, like, is he, is he stuck in the past telling this story or is he, you know, in the, in the present slash future timeline telling the story? We, we have no idea. And I think yeah. that this, the text has intentionally situated itself where we have no idea. I agree. That's very fun. I also really like this. Uh, the key was attached to a wooden paddle, the key for the bathroom, with men printed on it. The other key had girls printed on the paddle. My ex-wife would have shit a brick at that, I thought, and not without glee. I just, the uh, as we've decided we're going to do with every King book now, we're going to really dive into and examine the relationship between a character and their ex-wife, even if the book is not asking you to. Um, but I really like the ways in which the Jake is kind of revealing his anger and frustration at his wife. You know, we talked about last week, I think that he kind of has a, a very like, what are you going to do attitude towards the dissolution of his marriage? Um, but I think we see kind of the anger and frustration break through the cracks of his narration sometimes. Yeah. It happens a few times this week where mm-hmm. some random element of the story will remind him of, of this. Um, and it, it, like you said, cracks through briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, so it's interesting. I think I'm also better understanding the purpose of this element of his, of his character. Um, okay. Where, I mean, basically as compared to Duma Key, I guess is what you mean. Yeah. As compared to Duma Key, Whereas like, this is, I, I don't, I, I now do not think that his wife is going to be like an active character in the story, <laughs> his ex-wife rather. I, I think, I think his ex-wife is, is, is a sort of thematic element that introduces the idea of like untrustworthy spouses or just more broadly like people in your life who are causing chaos and you know an element of randomness you could say sure um because because you know he's on this mission right now to stop this guy from murdering his family um in a in a a possibly alcohol induced rage Mm-hmm. And so the idea of, of having a, a, a alcoholic spouse, I think, becomes very relevant, actually. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I get that. So Jake uh, buys a suitcase and then heads to the local barber to get himself a haircut. We see, Matt, that the, the proprietor of this establishment is a proud Democrat. Um, but also, we see two things in here. So the first is, I picked up a copy of Man's Adventure to Fistar for to forestall further conversation on the cover, a subhuman Asian gent with a whip in one hand gloved hand was approaching a blonde, lovely tied to a post. The story that went with it was called Jap sex slaves of the Pacific. Um, we also get this little bit here. Well, you're in God's country now. How short do you want it short enough? So I don't look like a hippie. I almost finished, but bomber wouldn't know what that was like a beatnik. Let's get it out of, let it get a lot of control, I guess, he began to clip. Leave it much longer and you'll look like that F word who runs the jolly white elephant. I wouldn't want that, I said. No, sir. He's a sight, that one. But hey, Matt, the haircut only costs 40 cents. Yeah, yeah, the the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like the, this, this is such a well-placed interlude because mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. it comes upon us right after we've spent a bunch of time enjoying the root beer and the ice cream and and suddenly like oh my god <laughs> <We're> <laughs> just, just, everything about this is um uh uncomfortable um to yeah. somebody to somebody from our time basically i mean i know this book was written like more than 10 years ago now but still feels like basically our our modern time our modern sensibilities yeah. um especially and, and i don't want to sp- paint with too broad of a brush here but i think i think it is intentional that king makes it clear that like these are proud democrats that like mm-hmm. the the, the barbershop is like littered with democrat uh, pamphlets and 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 signage right the, the, we're, and i think we're intentionally drawing a contrast between this guy who's like saying he's a proud democrat dropping a a a, a, a slur against a gay person um it, it, like 
is is meant to uh, you a person reading in 2011 or even 2024 reading that someone was a democrat would perhaps make an assumption about his feelings towards gay people or, or towards towards Asian people that maybe a Democrat in 2024 would not carry a magazine yeah. uh, that makes that makes Asian people look subhuman um, right. or or use use uh, a slur like that. Um, like that is in my mind, like we're doing that on purpose. Like we didn't we didn't accidentally decide to call this guy a proud Democrat and then do these things. Like this yeah. is all part of King doing exactly what you're meaning that like we are we are taking you out of your comfort zone of of this nostalgic delight of the past and be like no 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 there was this shit here too i love what you said last week i was listening back to the episode and i was editing it um so i guess uh jake is white <laughs> it's like the perfect <laughs> the perfect yeah. thing to say because yes obviously if jake was a black man this experience would be totally different yeah. everyone's so friendly yeah yeah <laughs> um, yeah yeah there's also if i remember correctly you know, there, there are multiple people in the in the barber shop, and they were like, "Well, you know, Fred's a Fred's a Republican," and and that's you know that basically matches my memory, even of the '90s, where <laughs> people would just sort of gently rib each other about their politics instead yeah. of like basically have a low simmering cold war at all times, which is <laughs> the, the way things are now. Um, yep. So, yep. and and that can be, you know, it's interesting because it's like that is kind of neither neither better nor worse but different in, in a way that feels strange to us now you know mm-hmm. i mean even though you and i lived through it i i, I think if you described how kind of easygoing people were about political differences in the 90s to, to young people these days they would be confused and and think like how how could that be it's like i, I it's just it, it was different in so many ways you know yeah um, yeah it definitely was i do wonder how much of that is also just my perception as a child who didn't pay much attention to that stuff. And also like, I don't know, like when I was a kid, like I I live in Texas. Right. So we were basically surrounded by Republicans at all all times. So like that was, that was really all I knew. (laughs) Um, I mean, and my dad, my parents are are much more left leaning these days, but like my dad was a air force man. Uh, Like my, my parents were both like probably voted Republican probably until the Bush years, honestly. So, um, yeah, it's just like it wasn't a thing really until I got to college. And then I was like, oh, oh, really? Yeah. Well, I think it's natural to be more politically activated in college. But I, I, I will yeah. like my understanding, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but my understanding is that like Democrats and Republican, you know, men and women used to marry pretty, pretty regularly. Um, and now it's 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 relatively unusual. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. I yeah, I mean, we're definitely certainly more polar polarized. Yeah these days yeah that's that's for sure yeah so, um yeah anyway yeah, yeah just the, the, the last thing i wanted to say about this scene is just the fact that i think it's important that we get this scene pointing out the shittiness of the past before we get to dairy to, to distinctly yeah. tell us like it's not it's like it would be one thing if this scene happened once he got the dairy and then you would just be like yeah dairy is a shithole of course <laughs> um but it happens in, in this same town which has the lovely root beer and the lovely people just to be like hey it's th- that's what the country's like and then yeah. and, and then mm-hmm. we go to dairy and then that's a different thing yeah there's this the shiny gloss on everything but the underbelly is is not great yeah. um but yeah and then dairy is uniquely different i think i think you're right i think it's really important we we did this before and not in dairy because yeah you could just <laughs> i love the idea there's like no, no no there's nothing wrong with 1958 that's just dairy uh-huh right yeah right. i like that uh, so the other thing Jake does is open a checking account at the bank. He deposits a thousand dollars and also gets some checks. The manager gives him uh, his number and he, he says Drexel eight four seven seven seven. Matt, do you know you know what this is? I do not have any idea what that is. It's a fun little uh, past thing where numbers used to be two letters and then five numbers after that. Um, and so in this case, it, the person's actual telephone number is dr eight four seven 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 but this is like the drexel the drexel drexel thing is like a mnemonic that they the, the telephone companies would give people to memorize what the the letter code at the beginning of their number was um i think like it it, it corresponds to like the service providers area in whatever place it is so like i don't know what dr means in relationship to Maine, I mean, I'm sure there's a thing, but this is actually a thing that it's, it's one of those, one of those things that we barely understand now. And I just like, think about this book 
50 years from now to be like, what? I mean, what's Bones? baffling is that anybody could use the numeric keypad to help to help memorize phone numbers, but nobody ever explained this to me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it's so much easier to memorize a number if you replace some of the numbers with letters, which you can do because that's how keypads work. Yeah. But apparently this technology was forgotten. That's that's really funny to me. Yeah, I mean, because it, essentially it's the same number of numbers that we have now, right? It's still seven numbers. Or I guess now we have more than that. But but like before we added the area code, um, mm-hmm. it was seven numbers. And yeah, but they just chose to use a mnemonic to remember two of them, uh, yeah. which, yeah, is interesting. I don't know. Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. I like mm-hmm. it. It's also funny that he deposits $1,000 with them and they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Sure. Like that you can t- they're trying to like playing it cool but like yeah a thousand dollars yeah exactly hold on let's do a conversion <laughs> I, I i was also doing conversions when, when <laughs> going over the script that's a uh, 10 grand today okay. okay not bad that's yeah that's a not not a not a small deposit to, i mean like th- their comment on that's a lot of cash to carry around makes a lot of sense because have you ever carried eleven thousand dollars around with you no no, no way i have not of course our our relationship with cash is also very different now than it than it was back then so true true um uh, so I, I also really liked this as he's walking out of the bank he kind of does a look back and we get this at the door i paused for a look back a couple of the tellers were working with adding machines but otherwise the transactions were all of the pen and elbow grease variety it occurred to me that, with a few exceptions, Charles Dickens would have felt home at here. It also occurred to me that living in the past was a little like living underwater and breathing through a tube. What a remarkably claustrophobic metaphor. Yeah, it actually took me a while to kind of parse what I thought that meant, actually, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's very specific imagery, but it's it not like specifically clear to me what Jake means in this exact moment. Um just that it, yeah, I think it's claustrophobia, right? It's this feeling of, of you know, uh, and, and especially when combined with the Dickens part of the quote, which is this this idea that the past, like things have accelerated as far as how often things change, right? Like, like the the idea that in eighteen fifty versus nineteen fifty, like there would be some differences, but generally a person could like understand what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, but then you look from from 1950 to now, and it would be like you you couldn't even parse what the fuck people were doing. Like even just like 1990 to now, I feel like the way in which we approach everything in our lives has so fundamentally changed that mm-hmm. it would be a shell shell shock type of thing. And just the idea yeah. of going back to that time and living like having experienced the things we have now and the, the, the conveniences we have now and going back to that time would be like, yeah, living underwater and breathing through a tube. Yeah. I, I was also thinking about this. I was, I was thinking for, for some reason, maybe for the first time about how even going back to our own childhoods yeah, to, yeah. to say nothing of the fifties would feel uh stultifying, you know, d- disconnected, right? You reach for your phone, there's just no <laughs> there's just no social media hit of dopamine on that thing. What am I going to do? Um very different world, right? Yeah, I mean and and Jake sees a little bit of that this week, right? When he gets to Derry and then is like, "Oh wait, how do I how do I look these people up? I yeah, don't even yeah. know Harry's father's name to look him up or where to look him up or I guess a phone book up. Oh, there's a whole page of people and like how how much of our lives are just run by the the knowledge that we have an answer to every question we could possibly have in our pocket at all times. Like when's the last time you left your house going to somewhere you've never been before and like had planned for how you're going to get there? You just don't have to. You you sit down in your car and you pull up Google Maps and you're good. Right. Yeah. I mean, if anything, this, you know, that when this, uh, when this book came out is sort of at a, at a line in time where like, I I feel like even, even just if it were written 10 years later, it, it would be more common for a character like Jake to just have never driven without using Google Maps. Yeah. Mm hmm. And, um, 
And so the idea that he's even going to drive to the area in the first place, it's like, shit, okay, I guess I need a map. So where do you buy a map? Yeah. <laughs> and then how do you use a map? <laughs> um, like that that's, that's its own problem solving adventure if you've never done it before. Yeah. I feel like the, the map quest, like it's such as like a specific, like it wasn't too long. Like how long did it take for us to go to the only way to figure out how to get somewhere is to buy a map and spread the map out on your dash and figure out where to go to, Oh, there's this, this program called MapQuest that you can type it in and it'll tell you exactly where to turn. You print that out on a piece of paper and take it in your car with you and you're set to, you know, now we have Google Maps. Like there was a, sh- a very short window here. Yeah. Like I feel like it was, it was maps for 2000 years. Yeah. <laughs> it was MapQuest for like six years. And now it's it's going to be Google or the internet for forever. Yeah, right. I mean, for for the record, there were, I, I distinctly remember when I was learning to drive, I would I would be going to somebody's house that I had never been to before or whatever. And I would have like a list of the turns like, yeah. writ- written down on a piece of paper um that i would consult and i'd be like all right i'm coming up across that road it's right mm-hmm. on that road and and I, I would i was always paranoid that i would like just sort of space out and not see the road and then i would just be totally lost irrecoverably yeah. lost um which i think probably happened a few times but oh yeah um yeah yeah i feel like we were f- like five years away from being the last generation to <laughs> or the, the last like cohort to, to never need to look at a map again yeah, it's interesting seeing like w- when all this stuff was first transitioning over, I just remember my parents being like, now, do you know how to get there? You got to go to this. And I was like, I got that. I'm good, dad. I, uh-huh. I have Google. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't need to get just give me the address and I'm good. Um, yeah, shoot. Now my uh, now I, I put it in my Google Maps and and also my watch vibrates when it's uh-huh. time to turn. <laughs> I don't even need to have my phone up anymore. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's wow. uh yeah, it's great. This is a tangent, but a valuable one that like just the idea of I think as technology th- as things go faster and faster and faster, which which they just tend to do, like the idea of going back a lesser amounts of time is is more fundamentally disconcerting. Like the idea I I love that idea. I love that idea that that you know, obviously technology improved between 1800s, 1900s, but like the, the dramaticness <laughs> That's not a word of of the change is just accelerating the further into the future we go. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I often say that we're in the early part of the singularity, because um, <laughs> you, you can you can really tell when you look back over the last few years and realize things you now take for granted were literally science fiction like three years mm-hmm. ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Jake buys some clothes and then heads to a phone booth to call a taxi. This is another fun thing, Matt, that in 2011, uh, men of Jake's age would have no trouble recognizing and being able to use a phone booth, um, even though they've probably never used a rotary dial before. But you push this up like a decade or two, and I think people would just be lost, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right. Now, I mean, just like what you were just saying about the maps, like I'm pretty sure my my, you know, grandmother's house had a rotary phone at it i doubt that i yeah. ever made a call on it because i was a kid but i at least saw it and maybe like yeah. played with it or whatever mm-hmm. so so i'm like i could make a call on a rotary phone if i had to because i know the the trick of it but the, the funny thing is there is kind of an unintuitive trick for like well how do you how do you make it do the number <laughs> and, <laughs> um and and I, I i think it's i don't know i i feel like if my grandmother's house hadn't happened to have a rotary phone, I might not know how to use a rotary phone, you know? Yeah. Same. I, it was my grandma's house as well. So yeah. 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 Um, and just the idea of phone booths as well. Right. Like, yeah. like I forget, I was probably on Twitter a, a few years ago where there was some Gen Z kid being like, so those things that always appear in the movies, that, that, that place where they go into and dial on the phone, I couldn't, she's probably just trolling because everything on the internet's fake. Um, but just this delightful idea that, the only thing kids of, of this latest generation know phone booths from is from film because they've just never seen one because they're just gone. Yeah, that's yeah, hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so as Jake is dialing, Matt, he realizes two things. One, he brought his cell phone with him. <laughs> uh-huh. And two, the dime he just tried to drop into the, the coin uh, return was from 2002. So naturally, the, the phone is like, 
hey, this isn't a real coin. Get it out of here. Um, I think I think the cool thing about this is the reality and responsibility of what he's doing here hits him like a brick. Like these are things that he just would not be able to explain away if he's caught walking around with them like it's no big deal. And I think it just it, it is this kind of slow realization for Jake of th- that, you know, w- something we talked about last week of, oh, this isn't a game anymore. This is serious. Like, this is scary. You need to be careful um you're you're being a little bit reckless and it's starting to kind of pile on him a little bit yeah i mean i i I love actually that the book makes a reasonably big deal out of these things that seem so minor like oh it's he's got the wrong coin Mm -hmm. um it really amplifies the sense of like ah this is a bad idea you're not taking this seriously enough you're out of your depth Mm -hmm. yeah i agree so while he waits for the cab he called he goes car shopping and ends up picking out a red 54 ford convertible which is just a great way to lay low jake Uh uh-huh great yeah awesome not making a splash at all nobody's gonna notice the bright red ford convertible yeah right (laughs) uh he he decides though to he's, he's kind of dickering with the salesman and decides to sleep on it and i do like this beat where he marvels about the one thing that never changes no matter what year you're in used car salesman uh is the one thing uh huh yeah, this is, this is a very fun scene. I, I love it. I agree. Uh, his cabbie picks him up and takes him to the motor court. And Matt, I think this part of the chapter is basically just this kind of one-two punch of Jack marveling at the changes, both good and bad. So like this idea that, oh, the urban sprawl is gone. Like there's there's not a, like just all this urban. It's like there's – I see trees and nature still, but I also have to open the window – Uh, to escape the constant smoke that my cabbie is just pouring out at all times. Um, Then he checks into the hotel and it's like, oh, no problem here. You know, it doesn't, you don't need ID. It's just cash. Um, But then he's sitting in bed and like the silence of the world is eerie to him and he has trouble sleeping. Just like these, they they were really, I think, piling on like the goods and the bads of living in the past. Yeah, I I think um, it felt to me like traveling to a foreign country. Um, that like the, the the description of it was was like um, you you're in some uncomfortable you know less civilized feeling foreign country stuff isn't the way you're used to um, and all it is of course is he's in exactly the same place he's just yeah he's just in the past and he's not he's and again it's not like he's in the past two hundred years ago he's in the past within a human lifetime ago um, S- Stephen King's own boyhood basically yeah yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think that's that's just so I don't know it's such an interesting angle on, on all of this on the whole idea of of time travel just out of all the time travel stuff we've consumed never really thought about it like this like how would it actually feel it would it would it would be uncomfortable it would be awkward it would be um, alienating you wouldn't feel at in 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 place even even to repeat myself even if it weren't even that long ago you know it's it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I like I like that comparison to like going to a new country for the fir- first time. And 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 I, that's one of the things like I think, you know, Jake is kind of sitting in bed, he's unable to sleep, he, his doubts are kind of messing with him. And and like this I, I remember distinctly this feeling I had the first time I I read or sorry, not not the first time, this time I read it. Just just having this this immense amount of fear on his behalf. Just this idea that like, okay, it's one thing to like step your toes into 58 and play around for a, a few minutes and then just walk right back to the stairs and back into safety. Um, but like he's about to he's about to leave the town. He's about to drive away and drive far away from his exit point. Um, and this 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 big, scary landscape of unknown. There's really no turning back now. I mean, there, there technically is, but like you're, you're moving you're moving far away from that easy escape point and just oh my gosh, this is terrifying. You're going off script. You're going like, you're just, anything could happen. And of course that's true everywhere, right? Like technically, but, but we mostly live in our, our bubble of comfort. (laughs) Um, And it it does feel like, you know, uh, just going by yourself to a new place, like hopping on a plane and traveling to a new country or even a new city within a country. Um, Yeah. Just this idea that, oh, and anything could happen here. And, and I have no, I have no home base. I have no place to hide out in um i'm just kind of exposed right you're exposed i like that you don't know what you're getting into you don't know that it's necessarily bad but maybe more unnerving is you don't you just don't know you have no idea yeah yeah um 
but yeah, I mean, I so um, King has in in a relatively small amount of, of page space managed to make the idea of simply existing in the 1950s seem terrifying. Yeah, which is not really something I've really felt before. Um, so in in this book, you know, the past is the monster. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that, especially the idea that like you don't know anyone, right? Like that by by definition, you cannot know anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's no one here. You have no friends. Um, you have no no teammates. You have nothing. It's just you. It's totally just you. You know, one thing I don't think I I thought of just just to ping off that is is like he thinks. In in, a, in just a second, he thinks about his parents, and yeah. it's like you're not at all worried about <laughs> accidentally screwing up your own birth. You're not <laughs> nope. at all concerned about this. It's very lucky they live out of state, right? Which uh-huh. f- feels like a conscious choice of King of like, I don't want a butterfly effect. <laughs> I don't want to have people worry about the butterfly effect of of uh, destroying your parents' ability to meet each other. Uh, so they're just dads in a uh, in. Eau Claire. I don't know where the, where is that. No idea. <laughs> and and mom is living in Iowa, uh, so not a problem. Not a problem. Don't have to worry about that. But you know, um, it's in Wisconsin. Of course, it's in Wisconsin. We knew he lived in Wisconsin. Um, um okay, we got to talk about Back to the Future real quick here, Matt. Okay. Um, how come when he messes up his um his mother and father's uh first meeting that how come the children slowly disappear over time, starting with the oldest and working their way to the youngest. That well, doesn't make any sense. The, the time wave has to propagate. Mm. It, pro- it doesn't propagate at the speed of time. It propagates mm. at the speed of changing time through time, which just so happens to be roughly 90 minutes of screen time. Yes. Okay. Any doesn't other any questions? Sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, how come when uh, Biff goes back in time uh-huh. to uh, give the sports almanac to his younger self and then goes forward in time again, he goes back forward into the same time that the DeLorean was in and not the new time he's just created by going back in time and giving the sports almanac to himself? Because the time wave hadn't propagated yet. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> it all makes a lot more sense if you just believe. If you just make that, shit up. Yeah, it makes just, a lot more sense. Just believe that there's a there's a rate at which time changes <laughs> propagate and that that rate is whatever it needs to be for this scene to make sense. <laughs> Fine. I will I will begrudgingly accept this because okay. I love those movies. Yeah, of course. Of course. So unable to sleep, Jake gets his suitcase out and messes with his phone and his money. He gets rid of all the new bills and coins and puts them aside. He sneaks out in the middle of the night to a completely empty, quiet world and tosses all those new coins and phone into a small pond. Um, obviously, he's never seen Terminator 2 and knows that, that that technology will be found and then used to create death machines. Yep. It'll be in a little glass cylinder. The <laughs> phone. Yeah. Fun fun. Th- thought experiment though matt uh-huh. if jake were to walk back up into the diner right now mm-hmm. and then walk back down into 1958 the phone and the coins would no longer be at the bottom of the pond right mm-hmm. but where where would they go i mean I, I, unfortunately i'm going to keep returning to my main if you say propagation of time wave i swear to god <laughs> i'm canceling the show right now no, not the propagation, because that because that wouldn't make any sense under time wave propagation theory. To be honest, <laughs> it's, it's it. I, I think I think it is entirely possible that he's actually just going into a different 1958 uh, every time he does this. So it's in some other future timeline now. So the, um, the phone and coins still exist. They haven't just been erased from existence. They just exist on a different plane. A different world, a different yeah. level of the tower, if yeah. you will. That well, okay. I mean, that that's that's what I'm saying to you right now. I don't actually think that the book is going to go that way. Okay, but that's that's where they go. It, assuming we are just going in, because like it, it's self consistent. What I'm saying is it, the, the idea that every time he goes down the stairs, he goes into like basically a fresh 1958 level of the tower that nobody else has been to before um is consistent and and then when he goes back into the future he goes into the future of that world not back into his own timeline so 
the, the, the terrifying thing about this is actually the first thing you, the, the first time you went down those stairs, you never came back up. <laughs> uh, you came back up a different stairs, which actually, now that I think about it, that doesn't make sense. Cause why would, what's his face be waiting for him at the top of the stairs? It's a different version of him. It's a different version of him. You're right. Okay. See, Matt, there's this thing called the propagation of the time wave. Ah, you're um, right. And yeah. it takes some time. So the, the, yeah. So that's why he was at the top of the stairs is because exactly. of the propagation of the time wave. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm really glad we we figured this out. All right. <laughs> All right. Chapter six. Jake wakes up and heads back to Titus to buy the incredibly conspicuous car. Uh, after some dickering, he gets it for three hundred and fifteen dollars in cash. God, I wish I could buy a car for three hundred and fifteen dollars. Uh huh. I, I love that he dickers over, you know, uh, ten bucks. <laughs> basically, <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's it's pretty fun. It, it's because right because like I actually thought this was an interesting character moment because he doesn't just go like sure three fifty whatever, like w- which is what I would probably do in that situation. I yeah. would just be laughing at the idea that I bought a car for three hundred and fifty dollars and uh-huh. he. And, and and he instead lowballs the guy and then haggles. Um, I, I just think that's such an interesting uh, uh, yeah. piece of character there, right? And and he has lots of money, right? And it, it's almost he's doing it just like he enjoys yeah. the, the haggling portion of this whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's part of the novelty of this whole situation. It is worth note, noting that the value of uh, three hundred fifteen dollars in nineteen fifty eight is is uh, is three thousand four hundred dollars today, mm-hmm. which. I wish I could buy a car for three thousand four hundred dollars. Right. Yeah, that's another. I, I I know we've probably spent too much time on this episode talking about like technology, but the the book is kind of inviting us to. And sure. I just I, I was just thinking how interesting it is that like uh, stuff like cars has actually like been pretty bad when it comes to inflation. Like cars. Yeah. Cars oh, have yeah. gotten more expensive and and they've basically, if I'm not mistaken, gotten more expensive faster than inflation. I um, mean, I think that the the thing I just said to you there makes that yeah. absolutely true. Exactly. But then then there's stuff like cutting edge technology like, you know, smartphones that have undergone like, you know, or, or like TVs that have undergone like incredible deflation, like unbelievable mm-hmm. deflation to the point where even somebody 20 years ago, if you explained to them what an iPhone is and how much it costs, they would be stunned. And if you went back to the 1950s and explained to them what an iPhone is, they would think it was a Star Trek thing that must cost <laughs> millions of dollars or something. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, it's just funny that, that it, it, it's funny what we, what we expect versus what happens where it's like cars. Oh God, expensive as hell, man. Magical tricorder device. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, they're not cheap, but you know, like a thousand bucks, like a thousand still, bucks. Yeah, not, not too bad, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I just like I, I, I just changed jobs recently and had like these. I don't know what they they're called. Every company has a different. It's like like bonus points you earn for being a good employee that you can cash in. Uh, uh you know, arcade like for for stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. And I had enough points to get a TV for uh this the at this game room of like a very cheap tv like it was like not high quality tv at all um uh-huh. probably under 150 dollar tv and it's so light by the way like it's a 43 inch tv that's like the lightest it's ridiculous um uh-huh. but yeah that's like so that's like so cheap it's like so cheap like and and it's a, it's a fine tv it's not like the tv i have in my living room that's amazing and 4k and wonderful but like it serves its purpose and yeah it's it's like uh, an hd tv for under 200 dollars. that's crazy yeah and, and yet yeah a, like any car you're gonna spend 30 grand on these days exactly yeah i don't know i, I don't even have a point with all this it's just one of those one of those past versus future things that just make it seem weird and yeah. alien i agree that the, the things the, the way things dip, like the price indexes for things change that don't match each other is just weird it's a weird aspect of our economy it is all right anyway we're so this was going to be a short episode because we didn't have as many pages and now we've gone on like fifty thousand tangents i know anyway uh jake heads out of town and we get this in augusta i stopped long enough to haul the top down in waterville i grabbed a fine meatloaf dinner that cost 95 cents apple pie a la mode included 
It made the fat burger look overpriced. I hummed along with Skyliners, the coasters, the Dell Vikings, the elegance. The sun was warm. The breeze ruffled my new short haircut. And the turnpike, nicknamed the Mile a Minute Highway, according to the billboards, was pretty much all mine. I seem to have left my doubts of the night before sunk in the cow tank along with my cell phone and futuristic change. I felt good. Until I saw dairy. <laughs> Uh, how ominous i love it i love it i love it that like so obviously we we kind of knew we were gonna have to go back to dairy last week but the the actual execution of this thing is so delightful not only i mean king is doing this thing where obviously he's like rewarding us right like we are the constant reader we know dairy we know it very very well it was, we especially know dairy in the 1950s very very well um and so we're definitely excited, but also I love the new point of view on dairy a little bit here. Like the way King describes dairy through Jake's point of view is really interesting. Like, listen to this. I came over the rise and saw dairy hulking out on the West bank of the Kanduskic under a cloud of pollution from God knows how many paper and textile mills all operating full bore. There was an artery of green running through the center of town from a distance. It looked like a scar. The town around the jagged green belt seemed to consist solely of sooty grays and blacks under a sky that had been stained urine yellow by the stuff billowing from all those smokestacks. Gross. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, this I mean, this is great, right? We we've never we've never really seen dairy, at least in the books we've read from the outsider point of view, right? I mean, like the closest we got was Adrian Mellon um, in the, in the 1980s version of dairy, but like that was just like an interlude. And, and unfortunately Mellon is not around for very long. Um, I love the way this place is described, especially considering it's the 1950s version of it. Right. Yeah. Um, like the, and the words like the hulking dairy was hulking on the West Bay. There was an artery of green, jagged green belt, urine <laughs> like the words here are uh, so charged yeah. uh, it's great it's, it's a it's a urine soaked hellhole as such bob would call it um <laughs> yeah I, I uh i i mean what's funny is the description doesn't exactly contradict anything from the novel it but it just makes it seem so much more obvious that the place is a hellhole yeah yeah um, yeah, to the, like to the point where it, 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 I think, emphasizes the way in which the residents of Derry just found a way to ignore it. And like from the kids' perspective, it makes sense, right? This is all they've ever known. So like right. they're not going to point out, oh, this place is gross. Yeah. <laughs> this, no, it's it's what we've known. But yeah, um, it's just that, that, that everyone is just – no one notices <laughs> any, any of this. Exactly. Um, and, and that's the thing, like we talked about this earlier, but I do think this is like the choice to, the choice to go to Derry. Like he didn't have to make Harry Dunning come from Derry, right? He didn't have mm -hmm. to do that, but we're, we're playing this really interesting game with the, the nostalgia of, of the old times, the the fifties and, and the, the joy, everyone, ev not everyone, but many of you want to go back to the, the simpler time of the 1950s. And Derry represents this perfect decision to be like, no, 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 no. The fifties sucked. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, so part of them were great, but so it was like Derry. Look at this shithole. Yeah. Yeah. And not only a shithole in appearance with, you know, no EPA or what have you, but like that <laughs> once we start meeting the people, there are all these surly assholes. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, I, which I think is kink sort of pointing out like, Hey, like, you're being dense if you really believe like, oh, folks in the past were just nicer. It's like, I I mean, maybe some were like. like <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure some were, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean there there may have been more of a like culture of, of politeness, but that's not the same as, you know, people being nicer actually. And also yeah. the, there was, you know, horrible violence just, you know, j just as there is now in some places. Mm -hmm. so. Yep, yep. So Jake takes us on a tour of the dairy we know and, and love so much. First up, we get to meet Mr. Norbert Keen, owner of the drugstore. We love this guy, right, Matt? <laughs> love this guy. Miss this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to see him. Jake uh, gives him a nice wave hello and gets uh, nothing, uh -huh. <laughs> nothing in return. Uh, Jake purchases a hat from the dairy dress every day and walks by Matchin Sporting Goods where they're having the fall gun sale. <laughs> oh. oh, boy. <laughs> 
he uh, does ask a few locals if they know of the Dunnings and get told the dairy's full of them, just absolutely full of Dunnings. So do you happen to remember if Dunning was the name that we heard in it? Because I just don't remember. So I didn't look this up. I meant to, but I'm pretty sure the answer to that question is no, um, that okay. there was no there was no character named character uh, that mattered uh, called the called the Dunnings. In OK, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's slightly interesting just because like King could have picked the name of a random side character kid from it and then been like, that was the kid. <laughs> you know um but uh but he seems not to have done that right yeah i, I just opened up my my pdf of it uh -huh. and searched for dunning and got zero hits oh, so there it is there we go yeah no the answer is no um so yeah i mean yeah you you would think that that <laughs> the desire to to drop some names we know and recognize would be really strong but he resisted yeah uh, feeling very welcomed by the fine people of Derry, Jake goes to the Derry townhouse. Hey, we know that place, right? You know this building. Um, and he he checks in. Uh, I, and we talked about this already, but I do love the realization that he has no way of finding where the Dunnings live or what their names are or any of this, that he's just been totally spoiled by the Internet age and the age of information and and just doesn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah, it's very relatable, obviously. So desperate for some information, Jake heads to the Dairy Townhouse bar where he meets the bartender named Fred Toomey. Uh, now, Matt, did uh -huh. your ears perk up at that name? They, that surname? They did. Um, is that the, the guy from the Langoliers? Uh-huh. With the tearing paper? It is. Craig Toomey was uh, the, the, the horrible, creepy Langoliers paper tearing. It, um, it, he then went on to read uh, uh, The Eyes of the Dragon. <laughs> Wait, what? No, I'm probably mixing people up here. Never mind. Um, um, yeah. We don't. I, so, uh, this is the thing where it's like, is this guy related to Craig Toomey? I don't think so, but maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think I think there are certain names that King just likes and yeah, they no, have a definitely. good mouthfeel to them. And I, I think Toomey <laughs> is one such name. God damn it. <laughs> uh Toomey, we learn isn't a local to dairy either and as such is resistant to the dairy curse of being a total asshole so he tells jake about the uh rough summer they've had which we might know a little something about to to orient you and and ourselves this is dairy in 1958 the same year that the losers club originally defeated pennywise that was in august if you recall it's september now so things in dairy are starting to improve but a uh, bad summer is putting it mildly. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it's, uh, I didn't think too hard about it because I kind of wanted to be surprised, but I was wondering prior to this, I was like, okay, so we're going back to 1958. Is, is Jake going to be involved in the plot of it? Um, and I kind of didn't think he would. So I wasn't like super surprised or disappointed that it was like, yeah. no, no, that was like earlier this year. Um, but of course, it does open up possibilities uh, like what we're about to see. It's one of those things. I agree with you. And I'm so glad we didn't do that. Right. Like it's one of those things that I think would just be the exact wrong choice for both novels. Um, it, 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 it would just ruin the magic of it as the standalone thing. And it wouldn't enhance anything in this book. Like I, I, I love I love that we get our 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 fan service of, of getting to see Richie and Bev here in a couple minutes. I love that. I love it so much, but I love it specifically because it doesn't alter anything in, in the novel. It like, we still have who they are as people in as children and then who they are as people as adults and, and nothing in this scene ruins that in any way or changes yeah. it or, or, or adds context to it that is damning to the things we've already read. And, and that King wrote uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, right. So I, yeah, it's just, it, it's perfectly managed and like I, the temptation and I, and I feel like, I feel like the, <laughs> like a, a different version of the story told maybe now in like the, the shared universe MCUification of everything would be like, oh yeah, we got to have that fuck around and in, 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 
we can't just have him go back to the same time. He's got to like weave in and out of that story. Um, and I liked Avengers Endgame, right? I liked, I thought that was a fun way of, of capping off everything of having our characters like weave in and out of the different MCU movies of the past. Uh, but like, just, it's the wrong choice here. A hundred percent. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad we didn't do it. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think, I think it as a novel is just this iconic thing that it, it just doesn't, the, the tone of it doesn't work with that sort of playfulness. Like it, yeah, it is very yeah. serious book actually. I agree. And I, I think, you know, that what we do here, I feel is, is like respectful, if that makes sense. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, if you were walking down the street and it's like a kid on a, on a silver bicycle that was far too big for him, you know, <laughs> s- s- swooped by me and it's like, okay, you know, all right. All right. Like, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to say what I would have felt. I might have felt like, oh, I saw, I recognize that. But, but, um, I feel like saying, okay, that, that stuff all happened. He's not, we're not interfering with that. This is, um, yeah. This is after that. This is, this is after that adventure. I think that's just better. Yeah. And even the pieces, I mean, we'll get to it, but the pieces we get are handled so deftly and, and beautifully, in my opinion that it doesn't even it it barely even feels like fan service (laughs) like like i mean there's moments where you think it could he could have really laid it on thick right we we, it says he's gonna go to the library and like your ears perk up and i'm like library ben we're gonna see ben too and like i i think he's not leaving dairy yet right like we have several more chapters in dairy um and so there's there's plenty more opportunities for us to do this right um but just the way it's handled in this chapter i think is is like the exact way it should have been Right. I agree. So we hear about Patrick Hockstetter's dead body recently found. We hear about poor Georgie Denbro, but the death that Fred wants to talk the most about, well, that's Dorsey Cochran, a uh, bludgeon to death with a recoilless hammer, a death not caused, at least not directly by our favorite clown, but, but it is one that so closely resembles the murder that Harry Dunning's father will commit in, in a few weeks. Um, and, and I think this is such an interesting choice here, Matt. I like, it is clear to me, you know, I, I can't remember which podcast it was, but King was was an interview on a podcast last year or the year before. I don't know. Time has lost all meaning to me. And and one of the things he brought up is is his his kind of frustration with the reception of it, especially in modern days, that like everyone focuses on that scene in it, um, but it, but isn't talking about like the horrific de- deaths that occur in the book as equally disturbing, like. And and he used this as an example. And I think he said he said this is one of the most horrific things he's ever written was the 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 murder of this little child Dorsey Cochran um by a recoilless hammer is like one of the things that has has disturbed him the most. So I you know, you hear him say that in that interview, and then you read this part, and it's like, oh yeah, like this the the, the fact that he's choosing to revisit this, not only in in bringing the the Dorsey death up again, but also like basically having a, a, another same event happen like he just creates a second event that is sem- similar to that one to relive it again it's like this is a thing that king wrote that he still thinks about constantly mm-hmm. and haunts him perhaps and yeah. and that's why we're we're looking at it again revisiting it again sure i i, I agree i mean I, of course also i think we probably talked about this before the idea that in in the film in the uh sorry in the book the shining um jack uses a a mallet not a you know not, not a hammer per se but a you know yeah. a, a, a bludgeon um yep and so it's just uh i think it's an idea that he finds very upsetting mm-hmm. totally um i also really love this part hadn't i heard or read about a series of child murders in this part of maine or maybe watched it on tv with only a quarter of my brain turned on while the rest of it was waiting for the sound of my problematic wife walking or staggering up to the house after another girl's night out I thought so, but the only thing I remember for sure about Derry was that there was going to be a flood in the mid '80s that would destroy half the town. I do, I love this, Matt. As like, this is the perfect example of why the horror of Derry went unnoticed forever. You know, like you remember the 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 general like, why don't people hear about this kind of thing? If this many kids, and it's just this is exactly it. It's like because people live their lives only kind of half paying attention to it. So even other residents of Maine would be like, oh yeah, wasn't there that thing in Derry where like a lot of children went missing. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's probably that that thing. Yeah, that thing. Yeah. I haven't yeah. thought much about that thing. Yeah. I mean, you you hear about these things especially back then, I feel like mm-hmm. if if something wasn't being trumpeted from the news at your ears, then you were just like 
wasn't there a some kind of event i I don't remember you know (laughs) like that's that's just the way it was yeah yeah this is also another example of his uh his frustration with his wife leaking out um like like it's such a almost non sequitur to the conversation he's having in his head right now it's like hadn't i hadn't i heard about these child murders yeah oh yeah let's let me get a dig at my wife here (laughs) for a sec i I did think that the the phrase my problematic wife was just very darkly funny and and (laughs) enjoyed that um but i I mean it's interesting how it's kind of on his mind though it is uh yeah yeah so okay this next paragraph matt uh, let's let's i have to talk about this for a bit as i let myself into my room i had an authentically horrible idea Suppose I changed things just enough in the next seven weeks so that harry's father killed harry too instead of just leaving him with a limp and a partially fogged over brain that won't happen i told myself i won't let it happen like hillary clinton said in 2008 i'm in it to win it except of course she had lost so i love stephen king uh-huh. I love his writing. Uh-huh. That last part, I think, is legitimately awful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nothing against Hillary Clinton um, at all, uh-huh. but just like it's a it's a sentence created for the last line. The except, of course, she had lost in a way that like nobody thinks like this. <laughs> like, wh- why are you why are you in this moment saying, "Oh yeah," like Hillary Clinton said. I meant it to win it. Like that sentence is just, is just said so you could do the except she lost. Like, I don't know. It's just like, this is unusually clunky for King in my mind. Like, I just don't, I just don't like it at all. Uh huh. I guess it just, it didn't, it didn't bug me other than the degree to which anytime I feel like King's personal politics enters into the story, I'm kind of like, okay, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I, uh, I, I, I guess I see where you're coming from, although I didn't didn't feel didn't feel too bad about it. Um, I just think like no person would ever say like like if I'm trying to encourage myself, I would intentionally pick a person who said that's not going to happen that I knew it uh-huh. actually did happen. Like it's just I, yeah. it's in it for the effect. It's not it, it doesn't feel true to the character with me. And I, I don't mean I don't mean the politics like I don't like I, I think right. he specifically says he's a Democrat and, and like that's not what I mean. I just mean like it, it's it's just like I don't believe any real human being would th- would think this way in this moment. Yeah, no, I I I, I know what you mean there. It's like you, you don't <laughs> you don't pick um um uh, uh Ivan Drago as your example of like <laughs> I'm feeling yeah. really confident in this moment, just like Ivan Dr- Dr- Drago. Um, I don't even think I'm saying that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I see what you mean there. Um, yeah. No, I mean, that's a perfect example. I'm in it to win it. Just like Rocky said before the first fight. Yeah. In, Except in, as we all know, he lost. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah. the other weird thing about it is that it's not even like, it shouldn't bother him really. Like other than wasting his time because even if it were true, <laughs> okay, yeah. like, like even if it were true that he accidentally, um, that he screws up so badly that he gets um, Harry killed, then he could just literally go back up the stairs and then go back down the stairs again mm-hmm. and it's over. It's it, it immediately reset. To, sure. to the way it was before and he gets a second yeah. chance as far as he knows right like, like so i'm open to the idea that like there are some other rules of this time travel that we're not quite privy to yet and that maybe he doesn't get as many free chances as he, as he thinks that's entirely possible but at this point he should be of the opinion of like whatever you know i i could i could screw this up apocalyptically badly and as long as i don't die yeah i can just go back and try again yeah that's true Maybe you should stop thinking about Hillary Clinton so much. And just, <laughs> yeah. just do do your fucking job. Uh huh. Um, just parenthetically here on this on this issue of um, time travel, or specifically the 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 doorway. Um, it snagged my attention last week too that you know we read a lot of stories involving like a portal to another place or to the past or to the future or something, and usually these are like a door, you know, a door or something like a door mm-hmm. how often though does it involve going up or down you know hmm. I, I i almost 
don't know if I can think of a single example where like you go down into the past and up into the future. I just think that's a really evocative way of framing it. And it, it, it sort of says something about this idea of like the past is down and the future is up. It's, it's uh makes it tactile in an interesting way. Oh yeah. I like that. I, I didn't think about it that way, but no, I really like that. That's cool. All right. So Jake attempts to find the Dunnings in the newspaper, but when he's unable to get any hits, he heads to the local library and uh, and and here, King, here, Matt is when King moves. I think uh, f- from isn't this place awful to isn't this place kind of magical though? Uh-huh. Uh, as we get reintroduced to a couple of our our new characters. Um, before we get there though, I, I do like this. He's he's walking up up Mile Hill, recounting his failures at both the library and City Hall. We learned the census records that he was hoping to get from the library. We actually moved to the city hall, which was subsequently flooded, leaving the records destroyed. And basically, Jake is 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 shit out of hope. He doesn't have any idea of how, what he's going to do, how he's going to find Dunning. Um, and he suddenly realizes he's looking down in the barrens and, and hearing music. And that leads us to our next scene. But one of the things he says in this moment, Matt, is that he does feel like the past is working against him here, right? Mm-hmm. Um that yeah. he feels like that 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 force that uh, that uh, Al talked about is is surely at work trying to prevent him from changing things because like oh the records destroyed in a flood yeah. of course and it's interesting because it kind of almost feels unfair because the records weren't ruined the the the, the ruining of the records has already happened like mm-hmm. it's not like as soon as he appeared in in the past a water main suddenly broke and, and the, rec- the records were ruined to stop him. The records were ruined years ago. True. Um, which he had no, you know, n- there was no way he could have even done anything about this. Yeah. So, so I just think it's interesting how, you know, it, it, if, if we concede, I guess that the, the universe has conspired to ruin the record. That it's like, well, the universe conspired like well outside of the time frame even of this adventure. Um, which mm-hmm. is which is interesting yeah yeah i agree i agree it, it is uh, the ways in which the characters feel like the invisible hand of the past is moving against them i think is interesting because it, you're you're absolutely right that this is just this is just like an inconvenience caused by mismanagement of things but in the moment it certainly feels like things are barring his way forward yeah at, at least until until this scene right uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so when he approaches the music, he sees two kids dancing with each other, two tweenagers, as we're called, not just dancing, but swing dancing. And we learn not only were they swing dancing, but they're swing dancing to the same song Jake and his wife learned to dance to and actually met to. Um, and, and we get this, this part right here. I was charmed, but was also what scared. A little bit, maybe. I was scared for almost all the time I spent in Derry, but this was something else too, something bigger, a kind of awe, as if I had been, if I had gripped the rim of some vast understanding or peered through a glass darkly, you understand, in the actual clockwork of the universe. So he feels some invisible force working here as well, but it's a different force and that raises a lot of questions, and we'll get to those questions. But first, Matt, we have to say hello to Richie Trashmouth, Tozier, and Beverly Marsh. And Matt, I gotta say, I love every single solitary second of this entire sequence. I love it to death. I think it's it's beautiful. It's touching. It's fascinating. It is it is everything I would want if we were gonna do this thing. I, we talked about this already, but I'll say it again for emphasis here. If we're gonna do this thing, we're gonna head back to Derry and we're gonna reference it and the characters in it. I can't I can't think of a better way to do it than is done here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think he approaches the characters with love and with the kind of gravity and and respect and and sensitivity mm-hmm. that he did originally. And, it, and it's it's delightful. It's one of the rare times in my life that I've been just kind of uncomplicatedly happy and and overjoyed to be revisiting old characters instead of yeah. kind of feeling like okay I can, you know, whatever yeah. no, that was great yeah i agree um a couple questions as we get into this out of all the losers we could have seen in the scene why do you think that we picked richie and bev um i mean i don't have like a, a perfectly clear answer I, I think generally my understanding of why king revisits old characters is that he has something else to say with them that he didn't hmm say in whatever that original work was um 
and I'm not sure what that would be with these two characters, but you know, maybe he feels in retrospect like something wasn't concluded with them or wasn't articulated with them that he has had kicking around in the back of his head for for you know decades now, thinking, ah oh, man, I really wish really wish I had just hit this one note with <laughs> Bev and or Richie um in it, but but he didn't, and he's like, Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that now. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um I have a much simpler answer. Mm-hmm. I just think they're his favorite. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think of all the losers, I think Richie and Bev are his favorite. That sounds entirely plausible. Uh, but but you're not wrong. And that's kind of the other question I had to, to, to ask you here. And you kind of already answered it, but um, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Is this just fan service? Are we just doing are we just doing the we know we know you you crazy folks out there love to see these characters. So here you go. Here's more of these characters you love. I, I don't think he I don't think that's it. that's a really interesting question because I don't just want to say like no King is above such things it's like well I, I don't first of all I don't think it's some sin to want to make your readers happy yeah. um and I, and I don't think it's some crime to like drop hints about things in your books like that that doesn't bother me I, I've enjoyed it quite a bit over the years in, in with with other creators and even with King when he when he does the referential thing mm-hmm. um but I also feel like in this particular instance there's a purpose behind it there's a um it's tying in with with the specific thing we're doing with this book and the idea of you know we're we're tying his mission in with like okay the cosmic turtle who tries to right wrongs in the universe seems to be on his side in this moment Mm -hmm. um and and that's um that's important and and having bev and richie be here helps communicate that and it's all in service of the story it's not just like a random thing off to the side for our you know distraction yeah i agree with that i I completely agree the other thing i I will say is as i don't if stephen king were to describe this i don't think he would describe this as fan service i think he would describe this as me service Uh and by me i mean him stephen (laughs) king 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 service Uh um we talked about this last week and and when i was talking about the idea of this the theme of this decade be king looking back um this was one of the things I was thinking about. I think this is a man, you know, coming closer and closer to the end of his career. Uh, He's, he's getting older. Right. And he's not only is he revisiting an idea he had from decades ago, but he's looking back at the past, you know, textually, but also he's looking back at his past. And, and I love this idea that one of the things he's doing is I just feel like I want to hang out with these, these characters that I love so much, just a little bit, a little bit more. A little bit longer, and maybe even in some way, this is me saying goodbye to them. Um, you know, I th- these these characters in this story was a huge part of my life. You know, he he jokes that when he's dead and gone, the thing that people are always going to remember is that fucking clown, and and but I think what King will remember is Richie and Bev and and Ben and Bill and 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 these wonderful children and and adult characters he created, and so I, I really do just think this is a I just. Like I, Stephen King, just wanted to see them one more time. Uh And I have the power to make that happen. And it it is going to be in service to the plot. You're absolutely right. Because he's he's fucking professional. Um, But. But man, I just want to I just want to hang out with Richie a little bit longer because I love Richie. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think there's something interestingly metaphysical about the idea because King could just imagine a scene with Richie at any point with no context since he is Richie in a sense, but <laughs> sure, but it makes it feel a little bit more solid, a little bit more real to say, no, it's in a, it's in, it's in this book. It's in this context. He's, he's alive and making choices inside this specific context inside this story. Um, I think that's just an interesting, I don't know, abstract thought about the way the characters can be alive to us, but, but only within certain limitations. Yeah, you know, he talks so much about the act of creation as as you know, we've, we've joked about it along that like the hearing the song, right? Is that mm-hmm. this is a thing that it isn't coming from him but is channeled through him. So perhaps the idea that I can only really feel like I'm visiting these characters when I'm specifically sitting down to create something with them in it. I don't know. Yeah, oh, I think that's right. I mean, I just like there have been a few times in my life where I've sort of felt like I was channeling a character and the thing is like you can't just ask me like out of the blue in some random context like what would 
what would that character do in this situation? I, I would just mm-hmm. be like, that's they wouldn't be in this situation. Like, like it has to be my mind has to believe that it's real in order to do the magic of embodying the character. And I think that's probably it's probably true for Stephen King. I, I'm just gonna guess. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's get into it. Um, <laughs> I, I part of me like has been looking forward to talking about the scene with you for months, and and part of me is like sad that we're gonna be through it here in just a few minutes, and, yeah. and I'm just gonna be sad about it. Um, so, despite his better judgment and the warning he got from Toomey, Jake can't help but talk to these two kids. They talk about the murders, and uh, he is reassured by the losers that they're over now. And of course, they know this because they they stopped it. Um, but then we get this. Then the girl said something that flabbergasted me. Do I know you? Do we know you? Before I could answer, Richie spoke up. No, it's not that. It's, I don't know. Do you want something, Mr. Amberson? Is that it? And so I think this is reinforcing what you said, that there is there is a force here bringing these characters together and and and, and giving them this feeling like they of, of familiarity and comfort and safety that they can they can feel free to to tell each other their secrets. Um, Yeah. And that's, that's what happens here. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just the right amount of gesturing at that, at that cosmic turtle without, um, without going full psychedelic on us. Um, Yeah. yeah, It's quite nice. Yeah. And and then Bev, you know, a little bit later uh, asks if he knows about the turtle (laughs) itself. And he's just like, no, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess that's this is the time to ask that question to you because, like, we've been told that the past is doesn't want to be changed. Like, the past is resistant to change. Um, but obviously, this meeting happens right when Jake needs it the most. He's kind of at a loss of what to do and where to go, and he meets these two kids from it, and they give him the information he needs. Um, they tell him where the Dunnings live. They give him the the street. Um, and the address and so finally he's got his information so it's like it's like the white or the turtle he is here helping him and it's like okay so are these opposing forces like the past not wanting to be changed is this is this a, a symptom or a symbol that uh the, the the forces of good want this thing he's doing to occur um that seems contradictory to you know what we've been led to believe about uh, the, the the universe itself pushing against the idea that things are going to can be changed. I don't, I don't know. What what do you think? I think it's possible that the that the turtle does want this wrong to be righted. You know, I I I feel like other elements within the Dark Tower and other stories we've read open the possibility that you know these grand forces, these sort of primordial forces of, of random and purpose and so forth they they battle within worlds they battle between worlds they battle across time i think a little time travel um to right a particular wrong is is not something that would even be new to to the purpose within context of, of king's other works um so you know it, it's almost like the the universe is the universe the universe is the multiverse is like the playing field and it has its own rules and then the, the purpose and the random are sort of duking it out across that playing field. I know I'm getting like incredibly uh, 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 esoteric beyond anything that's actually in this book, mm, which, mm-hmm. which I honestly try not to do super often, but it's kind of unavoidable in a book where he's just immediately diving into the time travel side of things, which is, which I feel like we have the tools to address considering yeah. that he has been, he's gone here before. I think um, you're you're fine. I think yeah, there, there, I have no problem with the way you're going right now. But yeah, no, it's a, I mean that's basically my answer is is that I do think that the turtle is not above a little bit of time travel. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh we do get this though. I this breaks my heart a little bit here. So J- Jake basically brings up the Dorsey uh Cochrane murder to them and hints that somehow he knows another murder just like it might happen soon. He actually goes so far as to say who it'll happen to specifically saying that Harry Dunning's father will be responsible for murdering his family. And when that happens, Bev can't believe it. And, Oh, this just breaks my heart, Matt. He says, 
But Mr. Amberson, I've met Tucka's dad. He works at the Center Street Market. He's a nice man, always smiling, always joking around and stuff, but never touchy grabby. And man, this breaks my heart because Bev's entire definition of if someone is good or bad is if they're like sexually inappropriate with her uh-huh. because that's all she knows. And like, it's just like, Oh yeah. King still knows Bev. Like to, this is just like perfect, perfectly characterized Bev. This idea that like she's young and she doesn't fully understand and recognize like how predatory men can be without ever having to actually like touch and, and grab you. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, uh, tug his dad, Mr. Dunning, is a monster he's mm-hmm. a complete monster but no he never he never like sexually tried to sexually assault someone um or me specifically and so he must be good and that's like the only lens she has on this thing and it just fucking breaks your heart yeah um oh right well i mean and, and her dad you know and a lot of the low lowlifes that she runs into are just like overtly grotesque yeah but yeah. like there's a whole subgenre of of shitty person who is their whole thing is that they're really good at hiding it and, and kind of yep. snake like sneaking up to you um before they before they pull mm-hmm. that stuff. Yep. Um, yep. So Ugh. yeah, it is it is it is unfortunate um and sad. Just to to go, you know, theory again for for one second like is do you think we're meant to think that the Dunning murders are you know fundamentally caused by the presence of it in the in the city of of Derry, like if, if if they had hypothetically succeeded in killing it instead of just injuring it, do you think he still murders his family later that year? Yeah. Um. So those are kind of two in in my mind two different questions. Mm-hmm. So like, do I think that the the essential rottenness of Derry caused by the presence of it throughout its entire existence? is what leads to this man killing his family. Yeah, I do. Um, am I going, am I willing to go so far as to say that like, if they had succeeded in eliminating Pennywise, that wouldn't happen that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's like, that's like a great question about dairy, you know, post 85 as well. Right? Like we see dairy in insomnia. Uh, it bad stuff still happens there. Yeah, (laughs) clearly. Um, yeah. so like this, this, this idea that like, even if you, even if you carve the rot out of this place, it's so, it's been so fundamentally damaged that it's always going to be this way a little bit. Now, now there's not going to be like a 27 year child murder spree. Um, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, I buy all that. I was just. I was just wondering because I hadn't even made up my mind. So I was just wondering what you thought about it because I was, yeah. I could easily see that, like, well, no, because it's not like they're claiming they defeated evil forever when they killed the clown mm-hmm. in 1980, in 1985 or three or whatever. Five. Or 85, yeah. 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 Um, so, so why not, you know, there's no rule that says that it can't just be a run of the mill, horrible uh, murder spree that makes no sense. Um, so, yeah. Mm hmm. So with that done, Jake helps them learn the dance they're struggling with. And he does this by slowing down the speed of the record. Uh, I I love this part where he's thinking to himself, time, plenty of time, start the record again, but slow it down. Yep. Nothing metaphorical at all about the idea of manipulating time to get the outcome that you want. (laughs) Just breeze by that. (laughs) Sometimes I just put things in the notes, hoping that you'll catch on to the meeting I'm Uh gesturing towards and then you just do it and i'm like ah yes this is why this works right and and yeah. and also you give me the opportunity to pretend that i got that from just reading it and not you know from having it from having my attention drawn <laughs> no 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 I, I, yeah, yeah no it, it's why great did you though. ruin this for me you just ruined the moment <laughs> <laughs> no it's great it's it's um it's a fantastic thing that we're doing here with with time and slowing down time manipulating time um i do wonder like should we take it even more literally like is he gonna is he gonna turn this into a strategy or is this more just like we're we're playing with the metaphor we're just we're just kind of having fun with the metaphor Um, yeah um 
I don't know. I don't know if I want to answer that. that that's fine. It doesn't matter. One way or another. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, and then so he dances with Bev and then hands her back to Richie, slowly speeding the record back up. And we get this, Matt. I'm going to speed the record up, I said. Remember your signals and keep time. It's all about time. Glenn Miller played that old sweet song and the kids danced. On the grass, their shadows danced besides them. Out, in, dip, kick, spin left, spin right, go under, pop out, and flip. They weren't perfect this time, and they'd screwed up the steps many times before they nailed them, if they ever did. But they weren't bad. Oh, to hell with it, they were beautiful. For the first time since I topped that rise on Route 7 and saw Derry hulking on the west bank of the Kandusky, I was happy. That was a good feeling to go on, so I walked away from them, giving myself the old advice as I went, don't look back, never look back. How often do people tell themselves that after an experience it is exceptionally good or exceptionally bad? Often, I suppose. And that, that advice usually goes unheeded. Humans were built to look back, and that's why we have that swivel joint in our necks. I went half a block, then turned around, thinking they would be staring at me. But they weren't. They were still dancing. And that was good. Fucking incredible. Yeah. Love it. That's on, on so many levels. It's, that's just so good. I mean, just first of all, just to say it, like the, the fact that he says, don't look back, never look back. And then two sentences later, he looks back because yeah. he can't help himself because that's who this character is. He's the guy who is in this very moment trying to change the past. You can't help yeah. but look back. Um, and that's what King is doing as well, right? He, uh -huh. by, by bringing, by reintroducing these characters to the book, he's looking back on them. He is... He's thinking like it's exactly what he's doing. And he's he's almost calling attention and acknowledging that that's what he's doing, that like he, he's almost saying to you, the reader, this this like maybe maybe it's revealing a little bit of his uncertainty of making this choice of like. Sorry, folks, you might not like this, but I just couldn't help it. I just uh -huh. I just couldn't help it. This is this is who I am. This is who we are as people. And I just couldn't help it. I, yeah. I couldn't help but look to look back on these characters I created 40 years ago. Um, and aren't they aren't they beautiful? Aren't yeah. they absolutely beautiful? I love I love these people. Yeah. And, well, and, and part of the, the subtext that I love is that he says, don't look back, you know, never, never look back. It can you know, it's, it's a mistake. It's always a mistake to look back. And then he looks back and and it's not a mistake. All yeah. it's, he just he just gets to see them that one last time. Mm hmm. And and they're beautiful, and that was good. And it was good that he turned back that that one last time. Yeah, um, contradicting everything that he just said about about, about don't look back, um, yeah. which I, I, it's it's so great. Um, I love it. I, I love I love all of it. I love like getting to hear to hear beep beep Richie again. Mm -hmm. Like as a, a person reading this book for the first time was just a, a, a joy. Um, this, by the way, Matt is like this book is responsible for the entire structure of season three uh -huh. <laughs> because I was, I was racking my brain trying to figure out the, the order to do the books that I wanted to cover in the season on. And I was like, well, I know I have to do 11, 22, 63 after it. Uh -huh. Like I just have to. And I, and I also know it has to be far enough after it that, that Matt has become a little nostalgic towards the characters that I'm absolutely convinced <laughs> he's going to love in it. And so like the more I thought about it, the more obvious it became that I just needed to just, do the the decade thing it all makes sense now all the the <laughs> wheels within wheels <laughs> become clear uh that's that's fantastic i love that yeah. um, it's 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 beautiful i i love i, I love everything about it like yeah. just seeing bev and richie again and and yeah again that that final that final beat to me is what it says about king acknowledging you know who he is as a creative uh, of a person that can't help but always look back um, and and ultimately, that is what this this book is about: is looking yeah. back, looking back on the past, and and wondering. And, and I'm trying to think if I can if I could say this. The thing that I love about the choice here is, like you said, this is after the events of the book. He doesn't go back and change these characters. And and, and you know what you said is like oh, I, I need to I need to I need to conclude on something that I failed to conclude on the first time around or, or reinforce something or something like that. It almost ultimately doesn't feel like that to me. It, it feels like a look back and just be like, Oh yeah, no, this was good. This was good. Yeah. I'm good with this. Yeah. This is a beautiful thing that I 
that I created and and mm -hmm. maybe maybe uh, this is more putting words in his mouth but maybe saying you know I, I think the beauty of this got lost in the evil clown of it all yeah and yeah. And, I, and I just want to maybe take take a little brief opportunity to draw attention to that aspect you know yeah yeah the the the, the genius of my book i feel um and he probably wouldn't use the word genius but the, the thing about my story that i like so much is not the evil clown that's the part that everyone else likes and it kind of frustrates me a little bit the part of my story that i like so much is these kids yeah right here and so yeah when, when we're going to return to the the time of of the novel it what am i going to focus on just the kids and what are they doing are they like you know thinking about you know pennywise no yeah. they're just dancing they're just dancing they're 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 practicing for a dance they're living their lives and and we get to see them in this incredibly mundane normal existence that you know i think that's another part of it is that so so much of the plot of that story is them going through one of the most traumatic ordeals of their lives and then subsequently 27 years later recalling that and having to relive it over and over again we we, we we so often got to see, didn't get to see them without the pressure of everything. Like, don't get me wrong. There were moments in it and we highlighted those moments and talked about how much we love them where we just got to see them be kids. And that was delightful. But even in that, there was still this thing hanging over them. Um, this is a moment of just pure, they're just teen, just about to be teens and they're, they're dancing. Yeah. And that's, that's it. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I even love the the element that it's just two of them because we know that the whole gang never hung out again. So you're yeah, like, yeah. So yeah. you know, Bev, Bev and Richie are gonna hang out. Maybe, maybe Richie and Ben will hang out later. But mm -hmm. um, we're just catching these two. Um, that there's something poignant about even that choice, right? Yep. Yep. Gosh, I love it so much. Yep. So Jake heads down to 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 Cosset Street where he just learned that his target lives. He walks around the street for a while, observing, waiting. At last, he sees the Dunnings, or at least he sees Harry and his sister being scolded by his mama. And, and the chapter ends with this. The boy who'd grow up to write a painfully composed essay that would bring me to tears followed her. The boy who was going to be the only surviving member of his family. Unless I changed it. And now that I had seen them, real people living their real lives, there seemed to be no other choice. I like this a lot, especially as it aligned with kind of your prediction for what must happen in the story towards the JFK assassination point. Uh, uh -huh. and at some point, Jake is going to have to uh, become personally invested in that. Yeah. Um, and, and this is perhaps a prelude to that of, of he was already kind of personally invested in this, but seeing the people, those people becoming real people and not just an idea just immediately crystallizes that he has no choice in this and has to act. Yeah. Right. I mean, one, one thought that I had, which I guess I'll just say, so I can, you know, either, either get, either get the credit or get made fun of either is equally fun for you. Um, <laughs> you, you jackals. Um, <laughs> um, which, which is, you say this like anyone has ever like really given you a hard time I, for no, getting stuff I, wrong. I know. I know it's all, it's all good fun. Um, is, is, is like, he he has to witness or, or i was going to say witness the assassination he doesn't even have to witness the assassination he has to witness the aftermath of the assassination and the people crying in the streets and you know just a, a nation stunned and reeling which is something that you and i can talk about in you know blithely you know because it's this historical event like pearl harbor like we've talked about is like yeah it's this thing that happened not really you know, I was terrible. It was really terrible. The president got shot. Like, mm -hmm. but but just imagine like walking around the streets and seeing people in that state and not and not feeling like feeling those feelings, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, totally. I mean, like we we talked, you know, theoretically last week a lot about like you know the the the, the consequences of changing the past and like the uh, kind of the agency you're taking away from the people living in the future. Um, but that's a whole different ball game when you're in the world right now, looking at the person that's going to die in three weeks and able to do something about it. Right. Um, right. That's like all, all that, all that armchair philosophizing just completely goes out the window. Yep, exactly. All right. So that does it for this week's reading next week. We, uh, I, I believe will conclude, uh, this, this part of the book. We're going to be reading chapter seven and eight, which should, uh, take us through the end of part two. 
Um, it's a little bit longer than this week. I think it's 70 some pages. So a little bit, a little bit more, but uh, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. We'll see. We'll right. see if, uh, if Jake can, can succeed. We'll see with the turtle on his side, but mm-hmm. you know, you can't win them all. <laughs> All right, Matt, let's get into the discussion question. Last week, we we got the easy one out of the way and asked the question, what is your favorite time travel story? We got so many answers. Yeah, a lot. So many. I mean, it may it may be the most ever. I didn't actually count, but it was it was a lot for sure. It was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And without further ado, uh, Pierre Jane says, I want to give a low-key shout out to Quantum Leap. Both versions were earnest, fun TV that we rarely see anymore. Not in a life-changing, oh my God, I need to watch it all immediately way, but in that, that was an hour well spent way. Of course, like all fun TV shows, the new one was abruptly canceled because we can't have nice things. (laughs) Uh, My real answer, though, is the Bad Wolf storyline from the Russell T. Davies four season Doctor Who arc. The words bad wolf show up innocuously at first, become progressively more ominous, and then comes together in spectacular fashion in the season finale. And then, and then, we get a callback three series later. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it. And why haven't you seen it, you nerd? Go out there and earn your who badge. Also, Fringe. I love Fringe. I need to rewatch it immediately. Too little time for so much time travel. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about Quantum Leap first. Um, okay. I watched watch the shit out of quantum leap, quantum leap when i was a kid I, I feel exactly the same way as pierre jane is describing where it was like um like like it, it felt like enriching and wholesome and like you had watched something good and important and poignant even though i don't know that i can even remember like th- three episodes of that show it, it always felt like it was something something good you know mm-hmm. did you watch quantum leap i never did no i don't know wh- why why not? I I mean the answer is probably because my my yeah. parents didn't watch it and that's right. That's it. Yeah, it we did premise. watch the shit out of early edition. You remember early edition? I do not. Early edition was a CBS show in the nineties about Kyle Chandler getting tomorrow's newspaper today. And then he got to try to go through it and fix all the bad things that happened today. So so the paper would change. Nice. So it's not really time travel, but it's kind of time yeah. travel. Sure, sure. I like that idea. That's a fun concept. That's, that's such Probably a wasn't 90s, very good. <laughs> such a nineties TV show concept, isn't it? <laughs> it's just, it really is. Yeah, it's perfect. I also have not seen a single solitary minute of Doctor Who yeah. ever. Me neither. <laughs> I, honestly, like the, at this point, it's just like there's so much of it that I just like I'm paralyzed by the the sheer amount of it right like there's just no way i'm ever gonna watch it because there's too much yeah it's like somebody telling you you've got to watch star trek it's like yeah okay right at least star trek like just pick a i mean i know you can just pick a series in doctor who as well but like which one exactly someone's gonna answer and then i'm gonna have to watch it yeah we'll see uh rumble boxer 89 says my favorite time travel stories have the elements where trying to change the past actually just ensures that what you want to change happens like 12 monkeys or in the classic the time machine these kinds of stories really touch me on a philosophical level what does free agency even mean when there really can be can never be any other outcome and your desire to change the past is implanted in the fabric of the universe before you've even taken action i also like time loop stories like edge of tomorrow which is gonna be the feel good vibe video game where you can keep trying from checkpoint to checkpoint until you've memorized every jump. Yeah. Um, so you hit two of my favorites here. Um, <laughs> two of my personal favorites. 12 monkeys is one of my favorite movies. I mean, it's like the perfect tragedy to me in like the, the grandest sense of the word where it's, it's just doomed by your own, you know, nature. It's just, it's, it's yeah. fate. It's, um, it's such a good movie. Um, and then edge of tomorrow is like, just the most uh, it's probably the movie i've watched the most times honestly like not even exaggerating just because i i just it just feels good it's just fun to watch <laughs> it's just fun it's a yeah. fun movie yeah. yeah great answers i agree the the whole you cause you cause the future you're trying to prevent by trying to prevent it is it's just delicious yeah. <laughs> just a, just as a story concept yeah it's just really really good yep um nosh says 
I'm going to go with two. For an inspirational read, I recommend Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman, a fictionalized dramatization of the theory of relativity and how time works arranged in short world-building vignettes. My absolute favorite is the 2013 film About Time, written and directed by Richard Curtis. The men in Tim Lake's family can travel, uh, can time travel limited to their own lifetime. Tim's father shares this amazing power with Tim on his 21st birthday. Tim then evokes the power to help himself and his friends, learning valuable lessons along the way as he matures from student to professional to father. What I love most is the quiet human story about the fleeting ephemeral existence of life and Tim's dad's use uses time travel as I would primarily to go back and read bookworm heaven. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I haven't seen it. Uh, I love that movie. That movie makes me cry every time I watch it. I've talked to you about this movie before. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful and it's, it's really about a father and son and their wonderful relationship and uh, such a good movie. Yep. I love great it. answer. Kasha Kuz says one of my favorite time travel stories is a Woody Allen movie called Midnight in Paris starring Owen Wilson, Rachel McAdams and Marianne Cotillard. Wilson's character Gil Pender is a writer nostalgic for 1920s parents. And while he and his fiance played by McAdams are on vacation in Paris, Gil ends up getting transported back to 1920s Paris and meets many of the greats of the time period. F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda, Ernest Hemingway, Salvador Dali, Pablo Picasso and Gertrude Stein. Among them is a woman named Adriana played by Cotillard with whom he begins to fall in love. As he travels back and forth between 1920s Paris and modern day, he begins to reevaluate his life, his relationships, and the nostalgia he has for a time that he was never really a part of. Uh, I quite enjoy that movie too. Obviously, um, the, the Woody Allen of it all is certainly a thing. Um, but unfortunately, I find myself just really liking a, a great deal of, of Woody Allen's films, uh, despite yeah. uh, not caring for him as a person at all. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is a this is a good movie. Yeah, it is what it is. I, I haven't seen the movie actually, so um, I think I you'd seen, enjoy it. I haven't seen hardly any Woody Allen films, but uh, um, sounds fun though. Sounds fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scantron ninety three says uh, I've been playing Quantum Break, a game by the studio studio that made Alan Wake and Control, and it has a very tight time travel story anchored by great performances from The Wire's Aidan Gillen and Lance Reddick. The game has this fascinating look at determinism through a character who was given a notebook by her future self, then spent the next few decades following those instructions to stop a catastrophe. It doesn't work, and we get to see her run through that time period again, an adult broken by her failure, taking the long way back to the present. Like all their stuff, it's a fascinating story and one that manages to stay true to its own rules while still making a compelling story and fun game. Cool. Um. I have played both control. Oh, no, I played control. I have not played um, the Alan Wake games. I, I feel like we're going to have to do. So Alan Wake is very Stephen King inspired, like a lot. Um, and I feel like we're cool. going to have to do some level of content on the two Alan Wake games at some point. I just I just know nothing about this. Like you're. I I have no idea what you're talking about to be honest, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm 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 open for for something like that. That sounds fun. Yeah, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, Tiny spicy cat says a sound of thunder is my favorite is by far my favorite time travel story. I think it might be where the phrase butterfly effect originated. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, is, is that the um, is that the Ray Bradbury? That's the one? Ray Bradbury. Yeah, book, I, right? I, yeah. I, I think that is. I I thought that was where it came from. Or before you even said that tiny spicy cat, but it's possible we're both wrong. Um, that, that's that's the one where um, they go back in time to hunt dinosaurs, and so <laughs> so they're going to shoot the dinosaur at the moment when they know that it died of natural causes, <laughs> and this is somehow not going to change the timeline. But then he steps off the path and steps on a butterfly, and that does change the timeline. Yeah, okay. Isn't this literally what the the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror yes. was directly parroting? Yes. Yeah. I I like the idea that in a thousand years it won't be called the butterfly effect. It'll be called the Homer Homer Simpson toaster paradox or something. <laughs> All right. Um, Squatch forty two says Dark, the German series on Netflix, is my favorite time travel story. Specifically, between the time, the penultimate episode of the series. Um, not sure that I want to read this whole answer. 
Um, it, it's fine. It's not, I don't think it's spoilery. The, the, seas, the series weaves a complex and intricate web of events and characters across centuries without feeling too cute and contrived. At the end of the previous episode, I thought they couldn't possibly tie up all the loose ends of the final two episodes in a satisfying way. I thought it would be rushed and leave some subplots unresolved. Not only did the show tie up all the loose ends, they did it all in one episode. I can't tell you to watch just just this one episode because without the context of the whole three the whole three seasons it wouldn't make sense but i've never in my life seen an episode of television that, pa- that packs so much plot into a single episode not a wasted second for the entire 70 minutes and it wasn't dismissive or vague no clunky dialogue or exposition mostly just events happening on screen it was like speed running the reconstruction of a rolex by multiple people somehow working on the same watch simultaneously even though they are centuries apart every gear and cog dropped perfectly into place and and then everything just clicked by far the tightest storytelling i have ever experienced also honorable mention to the episodes uh, of DuckTales when Huey, Louie, and Dewey get a magic watch that freezes time. How are you going <laughs> to you gonna follow up this, this beautiful paragraph speaking about this show so wonderfully with, yeah. oh yeah, also DuckTales. DuckTales. <laughs> Seriously though, that was an incredibly compelling pitch for Dark. <laughs> oh, like 100%. I have, I have heard a lot of things about the show and never watched it myself. And now I'm like, do I have time to start watching this this week? Yeah, no. Uh, the answer is no. It, but um, <laughs> I, I soon. Yeah, it it did rocket up the standings based on just that yeah. paragraph. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, ben Westward says, "I'm going to go with Edge of Tomorrow." Hey, here you go, Matt. Or, or is it sometimes known once the marketing teams realized they had a horribly bland name on their hands? Live, die, repeat. This came out in 2014, an era of bland action movies following bland storylines with bland frontmen. Many of these involved Tom Cruise or Will Smith or Bruce Willis or Keanu Reeves. But Tom Cruise stuck, struck a gold in this underappreciated gem where the protagonist is forced to live his life from the exact same point over and over, only to start over again when he dies, retaining all of his memories when he's allowed to try it all over again. With incremental improvements and a whole lot of dying, the results in him eventually becoming a super soldier, able to stand toe-to-toe with the interdimensional alien antagonists. As I'm typing this, it sounds a lot like Groundhog Day. <laughs> Fuck it. Is it too late to switch to Groundhog Day? Anyway, in Edge of Tomorrow, I do like the stakes are high, that there's a solid blend of action and comedy, and there are a few fun twists along the way. It felt very much like a like living a video game. Yeah. Um, obviously, we talked about this briefly already, but great movie. Yeah. Perfect answer. Right. And and good good to mention that it is funny. Like it's quite it's it quite funny. funny yeah. a, a lot of really good. Like so, some Tom Cruise when he gets to be funny, he's very funny. Yeah. It is it's so interesting that Cruise can be so weird, <laughs> but he's so specifically good in exactly this kind of thing. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, he 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 can't. He he's so weird, but also he's so personable, which is the greatest paradox, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah yeah he's he's a very good movie very fun movie yeah. all right uh t and bug doc says others have already thrown out a couple of my favorites 12 monkeys back to the future and terminator i want to give a shout out to groundhog day the time travel rules basically follow those of 11 63 injecting our troubled protagonist back on the morning of february 2nd over and over again until he can get the day right and all previous actions are erased every time he completes the cycle imagine having an, an eternity to find out to, sorry, to find a way to go about one pivotal day in your life the right way. His various moments of shock, megalomania, frivolity, despair, and eventual acceptance are priceless. It's a great mix of comedy and philosophy. Yes. Uh, of course. I mean, it's a perfect movie. Yeah. Right. It's, um, I, I think, I think one thing that this answer indicates that, that I think is core to the movie's functioning is that he has no idea what the rules are actually he has to figure it all Mm -hmm. out for himself and he doesn't even know what will free him from this this loop so so he (laughs) he becomes a good person as a last resort (laughs) yeah yeah i mean it is it is interesting to to say they the rules basically follow 11 22 63 which is like technically correct right and that he returns to the same point in time as always but i think it, it is a huge difference in you can manually control when you return to that point in 11, 6, 22, 63, right? right? Like you right. have, you, you can pull that cord anytime you want to, whereas in Groundhog Day, you, you lack complete control over that. Yeah. Um, Unless you have a toaster and a bathtub handy. Sure. But like, yeah, obviously in 11, 22, 63, you can live your entire life in that time 
True. If you want to, and then True. go back to yes. the, yeah, but, but exactly. Yeah. But uh, we watched that movie for a Doofcast episode not long ago. Or actually, it was a long time ago. Um, yeah, only like six years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it holds up. It's a great movie. I love it so much. Yep. Uh, last, we have Baby Can You Dig Your Sam, who says, I love Back to the Future and Bill and Ted's excellent adventure for merging sci-fi and comedy so seamlessly. But since no one has mentioned it yet, I have to go back to the OG Terminator. T2 is by far the superior movie, but the love story between Sarah and Reese is so damn beautiful. I came across time for you, Sarah. So many iconic moments in that movie. I realize Cameron kind of stole the idea from Harlan Ellison, but it was wonderfully executed. Yeah. Also, 11 63 is definitely a favorite. So much to say, but I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, that's that's OK. Now that mm-hmm. uh, Terminator. Yeah, great. Great story. Um so I mean, I feel like I feel like Terminator was incredibly impactful on our culture, actually. Yep. In so many ways, like just like like literally many different ways. Like <laughs> deadly robots are gonna kill us all. Um, nuclear war fears. Um, I, I don't know. It's just it's such a it's such a smart movie, right? Yeah. And and it also has the same thing we talked about earlier that we love in these time travel stories so much that like by sending a Terminator back in time to kill Sarah Connor, they they created John Connor right. <laughs> essentially because yeah. Reese went back in time to stop them. And then, yeah, the, the irony yeah. of that is right. Delicious. Yeah. And cultivated her into the badass warrior. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who then taught her son. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's all, it's all great. Uh, let's, those two movies are wonderful it it remains to me almost absurd that they take this wonderful concept make two perfect movies out of it uh-huh. essentially yeah not not entirely perfect but perfect enough and then just cannot make a good movie <laughs> after that just uh-huh. cannot yeah it's d- debatable whether they're even trying to make a good movie at this point they're <laughs> fair they're just printing terminator product and some of you right now are saying no 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 terminator dark fate was good to which i say no no it it wasn't i don't even know i don't even remember if i watched that one or not but is that the one where john connor gets killed immediately (laughs) (laughs) i don't even remember it's the one where linda hamilton comes back okay Um, so i think so yes (laughs) That's just so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next week's question, Matt, uh, I, I had trouble wording this one. So let's see if we could live kind of solve the puzzle of this one. So obviously the question we wanted to, the thing we wanted to build the question around was the scene in Derry with Richie and Bev. This, this wonderful moment where we go back to a place um, as kind of a love letter to two of, of King's favorite characters um, so, so maybe returning to a, a story that an author wrote, or, or, or pay, maybe it'd be even more fun to say, maybe it's not even necessarily your story that you're, you're, I don't, how do we phrase this question? Um, um, <laughs> we should have talked about this before what, we started what, recording the episode. What's your favorite instance of an author, uh, returning to his old stomping grounds? That is... A good way to phrase it. Sufficiently vague that it lets people have fun with the premise of, of, of what you're getting at. Yeah. Um, but I think I think points in the right direction. I like it. Excellent. All right. That is going to do it for us this week. Next week, we, as we said, 1122 to 63, we'll continue as we conclude part two. We will be reading chapters seven and eight of the novel. Um, Matt. Things are gonna happen. That's important for a story, actually. Plot events will occur. Okay. Characters will experience conflict. I'm anticipating these feeling emotions. Those will be felt. Excellent. (laughs) Remember, you too can feel emotions (laughs) by following us on Twitter. (laughs) <laughs> um, and you can answer uh, the discussion question that we just mentioned on uh, the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doof media 
um, or you can send us an email with your answer. You should also follow us on Instagram um, because I did a a, a reel, um, I believe is what they're called, of me trying Moxie for the first time. And it's there right now if you want to go go watch it. Yeah. It's, it's a great viral. experience. And we don't just mean the viruses that were in the Moxie can. <laughs> don't get us sued. <laughs> I'm, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, if you want to buy some merch, you should do so. You should head over to doofmedia.myshopify.com right this very second and get some incredible merch. Um, I uh, I started a new job on Monday, and my phone has the 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 door on the beach on it, the um, uh-huh. phone case, uh-huh. and uh, I, I had to answer my coworker's question about what's that from. <laughs> a <laughs> podcast. Like, well, you better sit down because uh, you're gonna learn some things about Scott Daly today. Uh-huh. Um, no, it was it was cool. It was just like that's a cool that's a cool image where's that from it's like oh well see i do a podcast um uh-huh. and then you see their eyes kind of start to glaze over and be like no 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 no. but it's good <laughs> uh-huh yeah I, I had a professional interaction where somebody was like well you got any plans for this summer and i was like you know wheels turning rapidly and i was like i'm going to visit maine <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do this summer? Oh, but uh, why are you going to visit Maine? Yeah, what are you doing in Maine? Well, a naturally long pause. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that was. That and was it's fun. important to say it's not because we're like embarrassed by it. It's just it's difficult to explain to the to the normies. It is exactly what's going to occur. It is, and and sometimes um, you don't necessarily want to to cross the streams. To be, to be uh, yeah, I also don't. If 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 hey, current boss, uh-huh. if you're listening to this right now. Please don't. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well. Um. Anyway. Anyway. But the the point is, our merch is great, and you could you two can have these wonderful human interactions where you have to explain to people what this stuff means. Especially our podcast me mug, which I have to assume makes zero sense to anyone but the several thousand people that 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 will listen to the show every week and that is delightful uh you should head to doofmedia.myshopify.com there's mugs there's shirts there's sweaters there's stickers there's buttons there's phone cases there's a blanket there's everything do you have a baby there's a onesie yeah i don't know that we've sold many of those get on that folks why haven't i bought the ones get the crank the babies out i have a baby Buy onesies. Yeah, you do need to Why buy them. Why haven't one. I bought the onesie? And I, I want a baby. picture. I want you have a very cute baby. I want a picture of the baby in the onesie, please. Yes. I, okay, let's. I'll do it. Excellent, Matt. Um, you're gonna get an expense submission <laughs> for <a> onesie, <laughs> and it will be worth it. All right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he- head to the store. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, and and you can get it. Like we we price this stuff, so we're really not making that much money off of it. It's really just about uh giving y'all some some cool some cool stuff. So that's right. Um, speaking of us not making any money from things, um, <laughs> um, if you enjoy Kingslingers and you want to support us, then please consider donating over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash doof media. Um, we've got a bunch of episodes of, um, us talking about, uh, King Stephen King adaptations on the bonus feed. And we've also got, uh, newer episodes of us talking about the TV show Castle Rock, which we're going to wrap up next In just a couple weeks. Yeah. 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 Yeah, of course, if you cannot afford to donate, that is absolutely okay. Uh, this show will will always be free uh, and, uh, and and loved, right? Yep. yep. Speaking of loving the show, <laughs> you can help us out by sharing it, telling people how much you love it, and by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's Spotlight Review comes from Blue Rider who says, on my way to the tower. First, I want to say thank you for such a great podcast. I've read the series many times, and I've been a fan of Stephen King since 1985 when I found it at the library in middle school. I must say you guys really do justice to the Dark Tower series, and I look forward to walking with you both to the end. So I think I think this is a, a listener who has just started listening to our first season, so they're not even at the end yet, which is which is great because they're in the past right now. Excellent. The, 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 the the COVID times. I hope they have a great journey. I, I hope so too. I, I do like, okay, let me say this. I love 
season two and season three. I've, I've loved them. I've had so much fun with you on these incredibly excellent books. But like we talked about when we finished The Dark Tower, there is something ineffable about those books. And, and, and sometimes there's part of me that misses those conversations because like those books are so special and so different and, and wonderful that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm jealous of people getting to experience you experiencing it for the first time. I know what you mean. I do. Uh, but thank you so much for that nice review. And thank you to everyone who continues to send those in. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. We've got 562 ratings now on Apple Jesus. Podcasts, which is so many. Uh, thank you for all of you that have sent those in, even the ones that that have had less than <laughs> good things to say. But yeah. they're mostly all positive. They are. Yeah. They are. Um, we, we really appreciate that. So please keep sending those in. They really do help. Uh, thank you so much. But um, that's that's it. That's it for us. We're, we're done. We've done it. Um, we're going to be back next week with a couple more chapters and a lot more conversation about uh, how Back to the Future got time travel just completely wrong. Those idiots. Yep, that's what this podcast is now. <laughs> Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Drink Moxie. <laughs> don't, don't actually. Please don't. Matt, the taste <laughs> is still in my mouth. It's, um, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Why do people drink this? Drink some water to wash the taste out. <laughs> <laughs>